at your headlines for tonight. President Maitri Pala Sirisena awarded chairmanship of BIMSTEC. Sri Lankan youth arrested in Australia on terror-related offences. Investments made via two companies causes losses of 1,600 million rupees to the Mahapula Fund. Land of the paper factory in Ambilipiti are under the government, machinery under the bank. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull resigns from Australian Parliament. The chairmanship of the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, or BIMSTEC, was handed over to President Maitri Pala Sirisena. This was at the conclusion of the fourth BIMSTEC summit in Nepal. Excellency, Maitri Pala Sirisena, President of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, to join me to take over the chairmanship of BIMSTEC. President Sirisena, delivering a special statement after accepting the new chairmanship, said that he will take forward the functions of the summit with a clear agenda. The President further said that the assistance of all the member states is expected to achieve those goals and extended his gratitude to the government of Nepal for holding the fourth summit of BIMSTEC in a highly successful manner as well as for the warm welcome given to him and his delegation. The President's media division said that all the state leaders extended their best wishes to the President for his new appointment as the chairman of BIMSTEC and they expressed confidence that the functions of BIMSTEC will move forward with strength under the leadership of President Sirisena. Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Thailand along with seven other Southeast Asian nations are present at this summit that concluded today. The BIMSTEC summit was held with the aim of developing the technical and economic partnership between the nations around the Bay of Bengal region. The conclusion of the summit was held under the patronage of President of Nepal. Foreign ministers of the BIMSTEC member states signed the MOU on the establishment of BIMSTEC grid interconnection. The next BIMSTEC summit will be held in Sri Lanka. It has been revealed that the investments made by the Mahapola Fund through two companies has caused a loss of 1,600 million rupees. The Mahapola Scholarship Trust Fund was launched for the welfare of students following their higher education under a concept of late Minister Lalit Atulat Mudali. The Chief Justice is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Fund and is often the Chairman of the Board. Using 300 million rupees from the Mahapola Fund in the year 2003, the National Wealth Cooperation Limited and the National Wealth Securities Limited were started in the view of adding more money to the fund. However, in the time that followed, this money was used for the benefit of various individuals instead of its intended purpose of expanding the Mahapola Fund. In light of this situation, the Cabinet of Ministers recently approved a proposal to liquidate the two companies. News First yesterday revealed how the money of the Mahapala Trust Fund were misused. And today, the minister in charge convened a media briefing to clarify facts on the matter. <laughs> These two companies that were established were politicized. From 2011, Johnston Fernando was the minister in charge of trade and his son was the chairman of both the companies during that time period. It was the money from the companies of the fund that he purchased the two BMW cars that he used for his private matters. Even after that, while Vikram Avira Surya was a member of the Mahapola Trust Fund, he also acted as a director of one of the companies and made an investment to a company at which his son was a director of. After inquiring into the matter by the 31st of December 2017, due to the investments made via these two companies, we have suffered a loss of 2,500 million rupees. The second point is that the Mahapola Fund is free of taxes. Because the money was invested via these two companies instead of from the Mahapola Fund, we have been subject to taxes. The Inland Revenue Department have asked us for 470 million rupees. If the 300 million was under the Mahapola Trust Fund, it would have become 1,600 million. But through the operation of these two companies, only 800 million was generated. Other than that, 480 million has been paid in taxes. When you take it as a whole, the Mahapola Trust Fund has lost 1,600 million rupees that it should have made. It was decided to open the Malabay Slit Technological University in 1999. 
The government allocated a 25-acre land for this. Even today, this land belongs to the Mahapola Trust Fund. First, 373 million was given from the Mahapola Fund to construct a building. Today, it has become an institute with 7,000 students. This institute was owned by the Mahapola and there was a company established to control this. It was through this company that the administration was carried out. But in 2015, this university was removed from the Mahapola and was completely handed over to this company for 470 million rupees. Other than that, as the land belongs to the Mahapola, lease deeds have been signed to pay 20 million rupees annually. This was launched as a state institution. The board of directors were all state officials. Now, there is not a single state official. A proposal has been made to cancel this turnover and appoint a responsible board and conduct the administrative activities of this institution under the oversight of the board. <laughs> against this. Yes, they have to approve it. But what we saw in the past is that political decisions have been implemented on top of all that. The committee has convened and taken decisions, but not with a proper understanding regarding these. With cabinet approval, we will be swiftly ending the operations of these two companies. We have external investors at Natwell Securities. All loans obtained from these external parties have been used only for purchasing treasury bonds. The total loan value stands at 8 billion rupees. There are treasury bonds worth 8 billion rupees as assets. So these decisions taken regarding the companies will not affect the investors like the ETI companies. When we say restructure, it does not mean the complete closure of the company. There are 25 employees. A suitable investor will be chosen and the shares of this company will be sold to this investor. The money obtained by selling the shares will also be added to the Mahapola Fund. A proposal has also been submitted to change the name of the Mahapola Trust Fund to Lalit Athulat Mudali Mahapola Scholarship Trust Fund. Besides changing the name of the fund, is it not the need of the R to initiate legal action against those who rob the money of the fund? Shouldn't the mismanagement of money at a trust fund, where the chairmanship is held by the Chief Justice, draw even more attention to the matter? News First will keep a close watch on behalf of the public. Good evening to you. Today too we are going to take a look at another misappropriation of finances. Before we get into the details of what we are going to talk about, let me draw your attention to this particular paper article that has been published on July 2nd this year. It says that the CEB in 2007 has incurred losses of 49,231 million or roughly around 49 billion rupees. That is the amount that CEB has lost in the year 2017 according to this paper article. This is where we start our presentation today. We are going to take you through what has happened. Now, we know that the CEB has a subsidiary by the name of Lanka Transformers Limited, also known as LTL for short form. Now, in the year 2006, when they wanted to create a combined cycle power plant in Kerala Pitya, they needed money. So they set up a company called West Coast. What is this West Coast company? West Coast company has shares of the government of Sri Lanka. It has shares of the EPF fund. It has shares of the Lakdanavi uh, uh, power plant and it has also shares of Leco, another company held by the CEB. What is their share percentage? The government of Sri Lanka owns shares of this West Coast company to the tune of 50%. Leco at 18.2%, EPF at 27.1% and Lakdanavi at 4.8%. This is where our story begins. Now, we also have to realize that LECO and EPF, LECO and EPF are also government funds. So thereby, if you take a look at the shareholding here, it's clear that about 95% of the shares of this West Coast company is being held by the government. Now, it is in this backdrop that this particular website, a website by the name of Energy Leaks, sends us the details or say publicizes the details 
of the accounting details of West Coast Power Private Limited. Now, it is interesting to note what has happened to this company and the profits it has made. Again, let me draw your attention to this particular headline that we saw a few minutes ago. 49,231 million rupee loss in the year 2017 to the CB. Now, you get your uh, utility bills every month and the power bill, the electricity bill is one such utility bill and you know how much you owe or you have to pay and that amount, you take a look at the electricity bill that is sitting in si while you're watching us from home this evening. Take a look at the money that you have to pay and just think for a bit as to where this money is going. If they increase the uh, price of the electricity bill by one rupee, billions is incurred by the CEB. Billions goes into the CEB. But do they go as profits to the CEB or do they go into someone else's pocket is what we have to question about and look into. Now, going back to this little gra graph I have here with me. EPF holds 27%, LECO owns 18.2% and the government of Sri Lanka owns 50% of the shares of the West Coast company that we just spoke to, uh, spoke to you about. Now according to the details of energy leaks we have received, we can see that when the dividends was shared among these, uh, the dividends of, so shared among the shareholders, 50% is held by the government of Sri Lanka. But where is the dividends that the government received? It is not mentioned. So thereby the government has not received a dividend from West Coast through the profits it made. We're going to how much profit they made in a bit. But take a look at this here. Lakdhanavi owns only 4.8% of the shares of West Coast Lanka Private Limited. And it, when it comes to the dividends, they have received 39.75% of the dividends that is to go into the government and the government the 50% uh, shareholder of the West Coast Private Limited has not received their dividends. Now let's go into the details of the profit made by West Coast Lanka Private Limited. Now these are the details as I mentioned earlier released by Energy Leaks and in the year 2016 they make a profit of 10 billion rupees and they have put down a value of 599 million as a financial income and if you just go into the details and if you have a look at the details that we have here with us, if they invest the profit that they made into a bank account, the 599 million that we see here is the, the money that they have received as a financial income. Now, this is a company, while the CEB is earning losses to the tune of 49 billion rupees as we mentioned earlier, receives an amount of 9 billion rupees as profit. And if you just go through the retained earnings of this company, we can see that they have close to 35 billion rupees in their retained earnings. The CEB is earning losses to the tune of 49 billion rupees. And a company that is held a subsidiary of this company, the CEB, the West Coast Lanka Private Limited has a retained profit of 35 billion. So that is the situation that is surrounding this prof the company that has been making profits. Now, the people who are involved in this in the past and presently are people who have been doing this for a long period of time. We remember how we've spoken about the activities of the Secretary to the Ministry of Power and Renewable Energy, Mr. Suren, Dr. Suren Bhattagoda and Minister Ranjit Siambalapitiya. And we remember how we continuously reported to you about the activities of the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka. Now, this is probably why the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka is trying very hard to have a grip According, uh, as to what is going on at the CEB and that is probably why the CEB trade unions, the engineering trade unions at the CEB come forward and say, you know what, we don't want PUCSL to operate, we don't want the chairman anymore and that is probably why all of this is happening. We talk, spoke to you about a company by the name of LTL. There are individual shareholders in this company as well and they are Mr. U.D. Jayavardhana, Mr. M.J. Marika and people like Pitigal. Now, now the minister, the secretary to the ministry are all people who are aware of things like this and they have to look into what is going to happen. As I mentioned to you earlier, while the CEB is earning losses to the tune of 49 billion rupees, there are retained profits for this company, retained earnings rather, uh, amounting to 35 billion rupees. So you can understand what is happening here. A company that is held by the CEB is earning profits while the CEB itself has been earning losses over the years. So once again, if you just go through, the president look seems to be aware of this. That is probably why the president is also encouraging the PUCSL to have a stronger grip with regard to the CEB. And the CEB have unions 
And these unions want the institutions like the Public Utilities Commission to stop what they are doing. They say that we don't want the chairman or we will not make the relevant payments. So these are, these are the situations that surrounds the Ceylon Electricity Board. And once again, let me reiterate, if they increase your electricity bill, if your utility bills are increased by one rupee, the CEB will be making profits in the tunes of billions. But do they go into the CEB as profits or do they go into people's pockets? That is the question that we have to raise. Today is the final day of the Enterprise Sri Lanka 2018 National Exhibition centered on reconciliation, democracy and development. The exhibition was officially opened by Deputy Leader of the United National Party, Minister Sajid Premadasa, Ministers Mahinda Amaravira, Vajira Abe Wartana, Wanjit Madhum Bandara and Eran Vikramaratna. A large crowd gathered at the exhibition which had 12 zones and the prizes for winners of the volleyball tournament held in line with the Enterprise Sri Lanka 2018 were distributed today. These footage were captured at the Enterprise Sri Lanka exhibition last evening. Parliamentarian Hirunika Prema Chandra expressed these views at the conclusion of a job fair held for the youth of the Ratmalana electorate. The people are starving and living under tough financial situations. What the general public of this country really expect is the prices of daily essentials to reduce. During the course of these years, while we were rectifying our mistakes, we forgot one important factor and that was the people who voted for us and their plight. We forgot the promises we made to them. It looks like we are providing weapons to the joint opposition to attack us. The human elephant conflict has battered several door to door initiative. This was the place where Shivalingam Janarath was attacked by the wild elephant. He was 18 years old at the time of death, and he is the youngest among three siblings. His remains were placed at the hospital when our team reached the village. His family was mourning his death. Our teams also saw how wild elephants were roaming within close proximity to the village. People living in this area cannot even cultivate because they do not have adequate water. A similar situation was faced by the villagers of Andamale and Valatapitiya. They are also facing issues as a result of the human elephant conflict. The villagers in this area charge that their crops have been infested with pests. As a result, their cultivations have been destroyed. They are also facing issues as a result of monkeys and peacocks damaging and destroying their crops. The residents of Gonagala said that they do not have infrastructure for their children to receive dumber education and that the child clinic in the village does not operate properly. 
The weather in the Banyamunukole village is filled with silt and the people do not have enough water to carry out their cultivations. The electric fence that has been set up around the village has confined both the villagers and the wild elephants in the same region. The primary school in the village is also at the brink of being shut down. The residents say that the entry route to their village gets flooded even after a small rain. They request that the road leading up to the Makiliawa village be broadened. The villagers of Ganga Palace say they are facing severe economic issues as a result of the lack of water to cultivate. They also said that they live in fear as a result of the increasing wild elephant attacks on the village. Although there are 11 buildings at the Mahagalvava Primary School, there are students in only five classrooms at three buildings. All the other classrooms are in a dilapidated state. The students who study at this school and pass their GCE ordinary level examination face severe issues when looking for another school. Come at the door to door initiative. A Sri Lankan employed by a Sydney-based university was arrested by counter-terrorism officers last evening over terror charges in Australia. The arrest was made after receiving a tip-off from a worker at the university. Mohammed Nizamdeen, age 25, was arrested by counter-terrorism officers at the University of NSW in Kensington. Police said they found a notebook that allegedly contained the names of several locations and individuals as potential targets. Nizam Dean, who is in Australia on a student visa that expires in September, has not been charged with being a member of a terrorist group. He was employed as a contractor at the University of NSW and has allegedly travelled back to Sri Lanka and other areas. The man was not known to police and does not have any criminal history in Australia. A decision has been taken to review the possibility of restarting the Ambilipitia paper factory. However, a company that acquired the factory to a lease has pawned the machinery of the factory and obtained a loan from a bank. The Ambilipitia paper mill that was established in 1978 was leased out on the 24th of August 2011 to a company by the name of Oslanka Paper Company Private Limited at 600 million rupees for a period of 30 years. An agreement was signed on the 19th of November 2011 to lease out the 44.3 acres of land, building and equipment belonging to the Ambilipita Paper Mill to Oslanka Paper Company Private Limited at 400 million rupees for a period of 30 years. By 2013, although the investor had paid 14 million rupees in taxes, they had failed to pay 200 million rupees to the Mahali Authority. The investor had abandoned the factory and it was later revealed that 400 million rupees, the value of the machinery at the factory, had been obtained from the factory yesterday. The machinery has been pawned to private banks. The banks do not have any use of this machinery. If they sell it off for scrap metal, they are still not able to recover the losses. What is important is not my opinion but the opinion of the government. The government should make a policy decision on this. I will get involved in this. If it was a project proposal by the former chairman, I cannot comment on it without looking at the proposal. If you have a number that I can reach him on, I will call him and I will summon him to the ministry on Monday along with the proposal. If it is in my hands by Monday, give me three days. I will go through it and provide a statement. You cannot work based on decisions of your own. That is what has caused this mess in the first place. Foundation stones were laid for two Udagamana projects in Galvava Hambantota under the patronage of the Minister of Housing and Construction and Deputy Leader of the United National Party, Sajid Premadasa. Foundation stones were laid for the Satsuo Gama and Siriyasiri Gama model villages under the Samata Sevena Yalipibidena Uda Gammana project. 27 houses each are scheduled to be constructed in the two villages. Did the previous rulers serve you by constructing housing projects? Did they even provide land ownership like we do while they were in power? I'm not telling that they did not provide any houses, but they did distribute it among themselves and their henchmen. 
but we are serving you without presidential power and I must thank His Excellency the President and the Prime Minister for giving me the strength to make this housing project successful. The second forum of the Colombo Defence Seminar under the theme Security in an Era of Global Disruptions was held at the BMICH in Colombo today. The event was organised by the Sri Lanka Army. The seminar saw the participation of over 800 dignitaries including international scholars, heads of think tanks and diplomats of 34 countries. The Sri Lanka Army aspires to bring together a global network of defence partners for crucial discussions towards formulating a collective and assertive approach to repel security threats on nations. Director of Combating Terrorism Fellowship of the National Defence University in Washington, Dr. David H. Uko, former Under Secretary General of the United Nations Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, Radhika Kumaraswamy, Colonel Commandant of the Military Intelligence Corps, Major General Dushanta Rajaguru, and several other participants addressed the second forum today. The Sri Lankan team that won the Karam World Cup 2018 reached the island today. The 2018 Karam World Cup was held in South Korea. The Sri Lankan men's team led by Chamil Kure won the World Cup. The team comprised of Nishanta Fernando, Mohamed Shashid and Udesh Shashika. The women's team led by Yashika Rahubadda were runners-up at the event. The women's team comprised of Joseph Roshita, Chalani Lianake and Madusha Ramanayaka. Threads of Time, a fashion extravaganza that will display that some of the best creations of style of Style Mart will be held in Colombo on the 2nd of September. News first, Azra Asan caught up with the managing director of Style Mart, Kavita Tulsidas. It's a little bit of a different uh, sort of concept. Tell us more about the brand that you're trying to create. There. The event that we're doing is this Sunday. It's called the Threads of Time. And then we continue with uh, two days of an exhibition at the Hilton, uh, at the Amethyst and Moonstone Room. And we'll be showcasing all our garments. And um, the Threads of Time really is a collection of Asian fusion wear. Uh, we're looking at uh, ethnic wear, but infused in styles that are very wearable today. Uh, and totally glamorous so it's it's going to be quite a spectacular exhibition and that's the wrap for primetime news thank you for watching have a pleasant night for the news first team i'm rachna farooq